so what we have for you guys today is we actually have a case study from the mines in Sussex and where their predictive maintenance department actually found a fault and using their technologies in the predictive maintenance department they identified the fault they followed the fault through and then they changed the piece of equipment out and so basically what this presentation does is how they what equipment they used how they set the equipment up and then the different technologies that they use in the predictive maintenance program so the one that we're mainly uh, concerned with is in vibration but in any good predictive maintenance program with any vibration program we use other technologies with the vibration to verify some of our faults so one of the technologies we use is oil analysis but basically when i see something in vibration where I see a vibration goes up or I see a problem in a piece of equipment, the first thing I ask for is an oil sample because what I'm interested in is the particles in that oil can tell me a lot about what's wearing in that piece of machinery. If I see a lot of chromium in the oil, for instance, I know stainless steel, chromium is an element in stainless steel. So if I see a lot of chromium and we have a stainless part inside there, chances are that's what's wearing. If I see a lot of brass and uh, particles, brass particles in the oil, well, the cage of the bearing is made out of brass. So that could tell me there's some wear there. If I see the iron content go up in the oil, then that tells me that there's some wear in there, that that bearing possibly is wearing in there. So we use the oil analysis to verify if we see the particulate count go up, chances are something in that piece of equipment's wearing. And then we also use temperature. And so we're looking if temperature rises, that's usually one of the first indicators that we have a problem with something. So all of these technologies are all based on a baseline reading. So when we put a piece of equipment into service, we assume that that piece of equipment's in pristine condition. It's been overhauled. It has new bearings. It has new lubrication. It's been balanced properly. It's been aligned properly. There's no soft wood. There's no pipe string. The thing's running in its optimal condition. So we put that piece of equipment in, we let it warm up, get it running, and then we take a vibration reading, we take an oil sample, and we take a temperature reading, and we use those as a baseline reading. And then what we do is we look for change from the baseline. No change from the baseline, no problem. Change from the baseline, got a problem. Could have a problem, may or may not have a problem. Now we have to investigate further. So with this little present PowerPoint presentation, they basically go through all the steps until they come to a conclusion, they make the change, and then they actually quantify that by how much money they save the mine by making this call. And you're gonna be amazed at the amount of money that one single call can save. We're not talking $10, $20, we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. And by the way, as you guys all know, this mine is down now, it doesn't even exist, it's been shut down. So this was done back in about 2006 is when this was done a long time ago. These guys that did it, Ralph Carr and Aaron Paraway are actually retired now. <laughs> the vibration community is pretty small. So if you get in there, you'll know everybody that works in all the vibration all around Southern New Brunswick pretty fast. And so these two guys, pretty good, good guys. Uh, both of them are retired now and I can guarantee that neither one of them is thinking about vibration right now. I guarantee it. So. Anyway, so here's our mine. So the first slide here, what we have is our piece of equipment here and what it is is a vibrating screen. So we have the size of the screen here, seven foot by 16 foot, pretty big piece of equipment, capacity 350 tons per hour. So they're putting ore through this thing and we're talking about a case history. So the first thing that once I, as soon as I see this, when I see vibrating mechanism, we can see the springs on this piece of equipment and that, this piece of equipment is made to vibrate. It's a shaker screen. So the first thing that we have to kind of know our equipment is that all our levels of vibration that we would normally see kind of go out the window because this thing vibrates like crazy anyway. So that's the first thing you have to be aware of what you're actually working on, what kind of a piece of equipment, what are all the characteristics of that piece of equipment. And that's one of the main things with predictive maintenance is knowing the equipment. So when you first get in the program, that's your main job is to get out, look at this equipment, look at the prints in this equipment, look at the manuals, get yourself familiar with the equipment that we're gonna work on. So with this piece of equipment, here we have Alice Chalmers, okay? Something really important in vibration is the speed that the piece of equipment runs at. So this runs at 946 RPM. 
That is one times rotational speed or the input speed of the motor into this gearbox. So if we do not have the rotational speed, then we can't calculate out any other frequency that we do. So very important, if we need the rotational speed, we could get that by strobing the motor on this, we could get it from a control panel, we could get it from the operator, but we have to have that speed. Also, the weight of the piece of equipment, and we know that in vibration, the heavier something is, the lower its natural frequency is. So the weight of it's important, 2,180 pounds. We're using Spartan oil, EP150, six quarts EP just means extreme pressure. And you're gonna find when you get out in the field that most of the lubricants that you're gonna deal with are gonna be extreme pressure lubricants because of the pressures, because of the heat, because of the forces that we deal with in this. And then the predictive technologies that we're using. So we're using temperature trending, vibration analysis, uh, vibration analysis and oil analysis. So every program, one of these is okay, but when we use them together as part of the package, it makes for a more comprehensive program, a more in-depth program, and it helps with our analysis. So we use these technologies all together to find out what our problem is in this case. So once again, we got to know what we're dealing with here. So the bearings, FAG 530897, cylindrical bearing. So from that, what the bearing will give you is the frequencies, and then you multiply those by the RPM, and that'll give you what the bearing frequencies are. So we have to know what bearings are in the piece of equipment. We have to know what the input speed of the piece of equipment is. And also, if we want to know what the gear mesh frequency is, then we have to know the number of teeth on the gears. So that information is all important. So all the first thing with any predictive maintenance thing with any jobs you gather as much information as you possibly can. So you're looking at the owner's manual, you're looking at the blueprints, you're getting the operator's reports, any maintenance reports, when's the last time maintenance was done on the piece of equipment, all that stuff, super important. So we gather as much information as we possibly can on this piece of equipment. We have to know the input speed, we have to know what bearings are in it, and we have to know the number of teeth in the gear, or how can we calculate out the bearing frequency or the gear mesh frequency or anything else in this piece of equipment. So very important, and basically gives us a look at inside. So the first thing that we did, and this is what alerted the guys to the problem here, is they go out and we do something called basic care in industry. And so what basic care is, is kind of like a vibration program but what we do is we have people go out and they'll use the little vibration pencil that little overall meter and they'll go out with a heat gun and once a week they'll go take a vibration reading to see if it's vibrating more than it was last week and they trend the temperature so we can see any spikes in temperature and the thing about this is is we have data here from 1998 to 2004 so six years worth of data on this piece of equipment here for temperature and as we look back we can see a spike here see a spike here spike here spike here spike here and another spike so a lot of times what we do is we always record our data on every single job and keep it because we can look back at our data and say okay what happened here in September of 2000 and if you look back they had an issue with the same piece of equipment, the temperature went up back then. So what we can do is look back on the trends, pick out these high temperature events, and then look at what happened. And chances are what happened back here, you might have the same problem happening now. So when they look back in time, every one of these temperature spikes, they lost a bearing in that piece of equipment. So clue number one, what's going on here? Okay, so temperature is what alerted them to the problem to begin with. Temperatures up, go back and look what happened in all these other spikes. Chances are, and when they look back, every time they had a temperature spike like this, they lost a bearing. So already you got about half your analysis done if you keep your records. If we had no records, we didn't have this, we'd be starting from scratch and we wouldn't know anything. We'd be completely in the dark at this stage. But because of good record keeping, all this, we already kind of are clued in. You know, chances are, if this is what happened back in history, that's what's going on now. So we've already basically have about 50% of our problem solving done because of our records and everything that we kept in our department. So once again, rotational speed. So we see screen speed, 946 RPM. 
vibration 16.5 in seconds. So I told you, this is a shaker screen. If I would normally see that level of vibration on any normal piece of equipment, I would run away screaming because this thing is ready to blow up. But because this machine is made to shake, that amount of vibration is not really that bad. That's basically what it runs at all the time. But if we were just looking at this without any context whatsoever, didn't really know that piece of equipment, 16.5 in seconds of vibration in the velocity spectrum is a lot of vibration. That thing is shaking like crazy, okay? But we can see our spectrum. This is what a real spectrum looks like. This is from a CSI 2120 machine, and this is an actual spectrum from this job. So they went there and they found the rotational speed of the machine. We have a spike here, one times the rotational speed. And if you look down in the corner, frequency 946.23 cycles per minute or RPM, exactly the same as the machine speed, one order. One order is one times rotational speed, two orders, two times rotational speed, three orders, three times rotational speed. So. Certain faults happen at one times rotational speed, imbalance. Two times rotational speed, misalignment. Five to 10 times rotational speed, looseness. So right away, as soon as I see this, I know that we have a balance problem with this because we have so much vibration going on. It's at one times rotational speed and the amplitude of the vibration, remember the amplitude's on the side. So how much vibration? The higher the amplitude, the more vibration we have. In this case, we got a lot of vibration, 16.5 in seconds of vibration. It's a lot of vibration. So we know what the operating speed is. Now, this is our waveform. So this is a waveform. This waveform is in displacement in mils. So a mil is a thousandth of an inch. So this is how we actually see how much this piece of equipment is vibrating. So we can see 200 mil, that's 200 thousandths of an inch. Minus 200, that's 200. So we've almost got that shaker screen is almost moving a half an inch back and forth every second. Boom, 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 boom. So when that does that, every time that thing moves back and forth, every bearing, every gear, every shaft, every housing fitting in that machine moves. Boom, 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 boom. So what it's doing is it's beating the bearings out of that piece of equipment. It's messing with the fits in that piece of equipment. The shaft that the gear is on is actually flexing every single revolution. Bang, bang, bang. And we're going to look at this piece of equipment later, and you will see why there's so much vibration, why this thing moves so much. It's actually designed to vibrate like that. We're looking at our vibration. Once again, here's in velocity, inches per second. Once again, in velocity, we're looking at uh, almost 15 inch seconds in the positive, almost 20 in the negative, tremendous amount of vibration. So we can see our peak to peak, and that's how we can tell how severe our vibration is, is peak to peak. Usually you want peak to peak to be about maybe three mil, four mil or something like that. Right now, 38, almost 39 mil from one side to the other. This thing is vibrating like crazy. So inherently it's made to vibrate a lot, but that vibration is also causing some damage to this piece of equipment. So once again, here's another one. Here's our waveform and acceleration. So acceleration, here's the actual movement, but there's something else going on here too. That slide. See how this one's nice and smooth? This is just showing the actual movement back and forth at one times rotational speed. When we switch to the next one, there's something else going on with this. So not only is that piece of equipment vibrating 16 inch seconds back and forth every revolution, but inside those revolutions, because we see all these spikes in acceleration, and remember a bearing shows up in acceleration first in the early warning of the bearing. So we can see we're measuring acceleration now and we see something else is happening. So as that thing is shaking back and forth, there's another vibration in there too. What vibration, right? And then we can look here and acceleration, our peak to peak is almost 12 Gs, peak to peak. So you think of your fighter jet or in your car and you do a 12 G turn in your car, you're going out the window, right? <laughs> like, or in that, so a tremendous amount of, when that thing switches direction, switching direction really fast and there's a lot of bang, like that's impact. Every time that thing changes, bang, 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 bang. So that thing's really smacking and then there's something else going on in this waveform too. So then we'll continue on further. 16.5 in seconds creates some problems for data collection. A lot of times what happens is 
real high vibe. And remember, this was done almost 20 years ago. At the time, the boxes would become overwhelmed with data because of so much movement there, it would kind of overwhelm the box. The newer boxes today can handle that much vibration. So this wouldn't really be that much of an issue. So it was a time when we couldn't collect vibration data on this machine due to our equipment limitations. Basically the limitation was is that the box would become overwhelmed. And so if you're just over on the board here, how we can tell that is we have our spectrum and we take the reading and what it would show us is this ski slope on the spectrum. And so remember we talked a couple weeks ago about resolution. And so we have the divide the spectrum up any vibration from let's say zero to five CPM goes in this bin, five to 10 CPM this bin, 10 to 15 this bin, whatever. When the box becomes overwhelmed, it doesn't know where to put the frequencies, what bins. So what it does is it puts all the information into the first bin. And then when the box does its uh, calculations, does its measure, it shows us the spectrum, it shows us this ski slope on here. So that as soon as you see that ski slope, you know you have bad data, delete it take another reading. So that's what was happening here originally, was that the box was becoming overwhelmed. So what we're using here, the accelerometer, we're using a Wilcoxon, which is a very common name of accelerometer, a 725 physioelectric, remember the physioelectric is the crystal, the accelerometer that we squeeze down, accelerometer, weight of the accelerometer, 30 grams. Remember when we talked about natural frequency, the weight of something, the heavier it is, affects the natural frequency. So with this accelerometer, we want to know how much it weighs. So in case we get into, because what we could do is get into the natural frequency of the accelerometer and cause it to resonate like crazy. So wait, and then, so we're using that accelerometer. We're using the CSI 2115 data collector with a 750 demodulator and a 100 hertz high pass filter. What a demodulator is, is just the high frequency energy. So when we're looking for Bearing, remember I told you in the early stages, bearing happens way out here on the right side of the spectrum. Well, that's what that demodulated energy does. It cuts out all of this lower stuff that we're not interested in, shows us the high frequency and also the 100 hertz high pass filter. What that means is when we're filtering something out is that we stuff that we're not interested in, it takes it out of the spectrum and the stuff we are interested in, it leaves it in. So we're looking for a bearing here because when we looked at that temperature chart, when the spikes came up, those were bearing problems. So with a 100 hertz high pass filter at 100 hertz, what it does is everything above 100 hertz, it lets through into the spectrum, everything below 100 hertz, it cancels out so we can't see it. So that's all it means by 100 hertz bypass filter means that anything over 100 hertz, it lets through, we see the signal, anything below 100, we don't. So you can have high pass filters, you can have low pass filters, doesn't matter, low pass filter will filter out everything else that was in the high frequency ranges and only let you see what's in the low frequency ranges. So right now we're interested in that high frequency range because we suspect we have a bearing. So that's why we use the 100 hertz high pass filter in this case. So we also are using the CSI 2120 data collector, newer data collector, a little bit few more better features on it, and something called peak view. Peak view is pretty much the same as demodulated energy. It's just their trade name for it. There's peak view, there's shock pulse, there's all kinds. Every company has a name for it, but it's all the same demodulated energy just means high frequency with peak view once again it would filter out everything that's down low and we're just looking at this high frequency stuff the high frequency ranges where early bearing would show up so we have that type of data collector here here's old Aaron who's nicely retired now and he's out taking a reading here with his box now I just want to for safety concern when you look at, you're out in the field, you're around rotating equipment all the time when you're out here. Now look at the stuff that he got on. He got a great big wire here that could get caught up in the rotating equipment. He has another sensor here that could get caught in the rotating equipment. He has a strap on that could get caught. He has a radio on his back. So make sure that you're aware of all of these things hanging off you when you go around a piece of rotating equipment because if any of this stuff gets caught in it, there's tearaways on and safety devices, so if something got caught, it would probably break off and wouldn't haul you into the piece of equipment, but I wouldn't really want to take the chance, to be honest with you. So 
make sure see how he has all this wire all coiled up to keep it as short as possible the reason he's doing that is so there's not a bunch of wires hanging around this rotating equipment that could get caught up in that equipment right so one thing that he is doing he's wearing long sleeves here and you got a watch on two no-nos we don't wear long sleeves when we're around rotating equipment we don't wear jewelry when we're around rotating equipment so do as i say not as aaron does okay and so we have a magnet mounted accelerometer. So we're using a magnet mount. That is your most common way of mounting your accelerometer. There's stud mount, you can glue it on. There's all kinds of different things, but nine times out of 10, when you're walking around with a piece of equipment like this, you're gonna use a magnet mounted accelerometer. So magnet mounted, okay. So here's our little accelerometer, very small. So that's a Fizio or a Wilson. I'm sorry, Wilcoxon 726 Fizo Electric. Sensitivity 100 millivolts for G. That's what a standard sensitivity is on an accelerometer. So if we had really, really high, 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 high gear mesh frequencies in that, we would use a lower sensitivity. So maybe a 5 millivolt for G. If we had something really, really slow turn, like, you know, 2 or 3 RPM and want to look, well, you might use 100 millivolt for G. So there's different sensitivities to the accelerometer. The speed that something rotates at dictates the sensitivity of the accelerometer. Accelerometer range, it can measure up to 80 Gs. After 80 Gs, it gets overwhelmed and it can't handle. Frequency is spot, so what it means is 5% roll off. So you're losing about 5% of the signal between two and 10,000 Hertz. Uh, get up to around 12,000 Hertz, you're losing about 10. And then this decibel level, what that means is the biggest vibration the sensor can pick up and the smallest vibration the sensor can pick up. I'm not gonna go into the math on this because it'd take me two days to explain this to you. Just that sometimes the, your accelerometer is only good as what it can pick up. So sometimes very large vibrations will drive down other vibrations. So with this one here, 3 dB just means that the highest vibration it can handle can measure in the presence of a small vibration. So, and then the temperature range, really important, minus 50 to 120 C. So a lot of times, if you go over this temperature range, what happens is it cooks the electronics inside here and it'll give you a faulty signal in that. So always make sure you, there's high temp accelerometers, low temperature, there's all different ones. Just make sure you have one in the proper temperature range. So, we're trending our data, remember? We trend our data and we have a trend here that goes from April 27, 1999 to uh, 9th of September 04. So five years of data there. And so we're trending baseline and we have our alarm levels, right? Alert, two times the baseline, fault, four times the baseline. There may be another one here. So what happens is, is the box when you have break this fault, it'll actually take that reading and set it aside for you to read later. So you say anything that's in fault, show me. So it'll show you every reading that's fault. So here's our baseline, everything's going along really good. You know, we have some variations, but pretty much the same. And then back here, and I don't know, thousand days in, whatever this date is, if you clicked on this, it would tell us what the date is. And so what happened here? Why was there a big spike? When they looked back at their history, they had lost an inner race bearing when this thing spiked up here. So there's a clue. And then now it alerted first one, took a reading, boom, went up here, broke the alert level. So something's going on, took another reading right away, stayed up so they know there's a problem, it didn't go away. So it's a mechanical issue. And then they continued to take readings on it probably every day and the trend went up and up and up. So a dead giveaway that you've got a problem, something going on here, right? So that's why it's so important to trend is because we can go back and look at these other spikes and say, what happened to this piece of equipment here? Look at our records. Sure enough, they lost an inner race back then. So now we're 75% on to diagnosing what our problem is. So this is called a waterfall graph. And what a waterfall graph is you can tell the box to give me your last five readings. In this case, one, two, three, four, five, six, our last seven readings. And so when you look at this waterfall graph, you can see there's change going on here. And to the experienced eye, as soon as I see this pattern here, that's an inner race. Like that's a dead giveaway. <laughs> that's an inner race. Because we can look at the, there's a bundle of energy here. There's a bundle of energy here. There's a bundle of energy here. There's one here. 
And this is basically, and then by looking at their last submarines, I can see there's been change between uh, the uh, 16th of June of 04 and August 25th, there was a big change. So something happened here, what is it? So when we look further into this, okay, I could tell, I don't even have to bring up my overlays or anything, just by my experience, I could tell that's an inner race, but you gotta look at a, I don't know, probably 30, 40,000 spectra before you get to that level, so. Anyway, so we got a problem. So we go on to our next slide here. So these, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna, yeah. these these are all spectrums each, like each month that you take it. Right. So, and then you put them up next to each other. Can, you, that, can you just kind of like, just touch on it? Cause so, I don't think my guys know anything so about what we the waterfall. Call this is, like I said, we call this a waterfall. And so when I set up my display on my screen on the computer, look, what I'll ask for is I'll say every reading I take. So I took a reading here on September 9th. Show me the last seven readings or the last five readings. And so this will come up every time. And it's a really easy way to compare your readings. So I can look over this. This reading in itself maybe wouldn't tell me that much. But when I look at seven readings in a row, there's definitely change. Something's been growing each month we take a reading. Something's changed. The vibration has gone up. The amount of side banding, and remember side banding is an indication of how severe a problem is. So you can see here, not very much, and then they more side banding, more side banding, so more spikes, more of a problem going on. Also, I could see a little bit of a raised floor noise here, a little bit more, another indicator that there's a problem or that it's getting worse. So that's why we look at the waterfall, is we can see the progression of a fault as it every month we can look at it. And easily I can look there and say, yeah, something's definitely changed there. I mean, this is uh, January to September, that's eight months, big change. Right, But remember, we find the fault early, track the fault through its progression, and then the optimal time to change it. So right about now, it's starting to get to be the optimal time to change it, all right? So once again, bearing, ball pass frequency inner race. So what we do is we program these into the machine. So in this case here, we have a bearing. A lot of times there'll be different frequencies for an SKF and an FAG whatever. So what we have, and so what I do is I put my overlay and look at every one of these hits a bundle of energy. Boom, boom. It doesn't hit exactly in the middle of the bundle. It doesn't, I mean, the line, but it hits at every one of these bundles. And so pretty good indication that that's an inner race. Look, bang, 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 bang. They, every one of them lines up with one of those bundles of energy. And so what happens, the inner race goes through the load zone of the bearing. It keeps rotating. So every time it goes through the load zone of the bearing, it makes one of these little spikes. And then with all the little side bending. And also look at the raised floor noise here. That raised floor noise is a dead giveaway. That's all your random energy or all your particles that are recirculating back through the bearing or making all kind of crunchy sounds and all that. They're not sinusoidal there and that's not repeatable. So the box puts that in raised floor noise. So the higher that goes up, indication of how severe the problem is. Right about now, this is like, change me now, right? Because if I let this go any longer, what's gonna happen is all this is gonna go away. And then this raised floor noise is gonna, so I'm gonna get one thing at one times, because the thing's loose or whatever. And then I'm gonna get all this raised floor noise and all these other peaks are gonna go away on me. So that's just experience when you look at things so many times. So once again, and we have a waveform here. So this waveform, when I see all these little spikes coming out of the waveform like this, dead giveaway, you got a bearing, right? You've seen the other ones where we looked in displacement where we were just actually the movement, but now we're looking at the bearing. And when I see a waveform with all these spikes coming out of it like this, that's pretty much a dead giveaway that we got a bearing going on there. So right now I'm about 90% sure that I got a bearing. I started at 50, it went up to about 75, and now as more information I'm looking at, I'm about 90% sure I know what's going on with this. Okay, so. So the normal filtered waveform, we can see these impacts, impacts, impact, impact. Every one of these impacts will be, if we measured from here to here, that'll come out as a bearing frequency. And so what happens is every time the fault goes through the load zone, the vibration increases. 
Every time the fault goes out of the load zone, it decreases. So it's in the load zone, out of the load zone, in the load zone, out of the load zone. In. So we call these angelfish. If you looked at a fish in the aquarium, your angelfish, he would kind of look like this. So that is another dead giveaway of severity. The more impacting are these in your waveform, the more problem you got. So right there's another, yeah, we got to change me now, right? So those little impacts. So that's definitely, well, if your inner race is moving, your outer race is fixed, then you'll see this. If it was vice versa, your outer race was turning, your inner race was fixed then it would just look right straight across here like this. There wouldn't be any modulation because the fault stays in the same place. It doesn't move in the inner race, it's turning. So it goes through the load zone. It's on the outer race and the outer race is fixed. That's not going through the load zone. So you don't get these modulations in here. Now we're looking back at the trending and look, mechanism replaced, mechanism replaced. Pretty good indication that when it's up here, mechanism replaced, right? So it's so important to keep your history. If you don't keep your history, you're in the dark. But as soon as I see all this data and I look back and the other time I see spikes like this and they lost an inner race and they lost an inner race, pretty good indication that I'm gonna lose another inner race right here. So you look back over time. So that's why our trended data is so important. Once again, another waterfall graph, and this one, this is a peak view reading. So peak view reading, once again, spike, spike, spike. That will come out at the inner race. Once again, here it was here, here it was here. So it's getting worse progressively over time. Probably this one here in August 27th, it was probably vibrating or changed maybe a little different speed or whatever. There was some bigger pieces going through there. So there's a little bit more vibration but I can definitely see change over this waterfall graph. I can see my pattern here really well in a race. So right about now, I'm pretty darn sure that we're gonna to have to change out a bearing here. So once again, our pattern, bang, bang, bang. If I measure from here to here, it's gonna come out bang on at an inner race on this bearing. So once again, a classic picture of what we would see for an inner race here. And that's just, all I can tell you is you've got to look at a lot of spectrums before you can recognize this stuff. So once again, here's our outer, our inner race on our bearing here. And we put our overlay on it, bearing ball pass frequency inner race, bang, dead on, bang, dead on, dead on. So remember when the speed that we had, we put the original speed in the box at 704 or 946 CPM. But then the real speed of the piece of equipment was 946.52 CPM. So you can see that every as we go along, this spike moves a little bit off the line. It's a little bit farther off here. It's a little bit farther. We don't have the exact speed. So that 0.52 RPM, what it'll do is as we progress along here, it'll kind of move off the spikes, but that's close enough. That is dead on ball pass. So right now, I have no doubt that we have an inner race defect on this piece of equipment. I know from the severity, from looking at my waveform, from looking at the raised noise, noise floor, that I'm at pretty much stage two, between stage two and stage three. I can still see all my peaks. So I'm generating a nice, uh, nice sinusoidal uh, waveform. Things are very repeatable. There's not too much debris going through this thing. So now is the time to change this bearing. So. Remember, we predict what the fault is, then we give a timeline on the fault. So in this case, it's like the timeline is change it now. So once again, so just another waveform here, the defect. So if we went, looked at this one's acceleration, peak, peak. So that's just another waveform that they do. It's, you know, once again, just another waveform, another, this is a peak view waveform. And you could see spike, 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 spike. So pretty much dead on, nothing there surprising. And now we've made the change. So we've changed out the piece of equipment and we went back and took another reading. Does that look anything like we were looking at before? Absolutely not. Look at the amount of vibration in this thing now. 0 0.006 in seconds of vibration instead of 16.5 in seconds of vibration. So you're always gonna see a little bit of imbalance. So this here is at rotational speed or one times these spikes 
So you're always going to see a little bit of imbalance in a piece of equipment. We changed out the bearing so we don't see any other bearing fault or any of that because we got a new pristine bearing. So now what we see is a little bit of imbalance. Everything, every time you take a reading, there's going to be a little bit of imbalance or something. A little bit. So this is fine. Look at the amplitude, the change in amplitude from 16.5 in seconds down to 0 0.006 in seconds of vibration in this piece of equipment. So our overall reading here, 0 0.018 in seconds. Perfectly acceptable in any chart. That is a good reading on a piece of equipment. So we change it out. We know we fixed the fault. We got a confirmation or reading. I don't see any more inner race in here. I don't see any of that raised floor noise, any of that junk. I just see a little bit of imbalance, which is perfectly okay for that piece of equipment. Thank you.